the words of the familiar song Amazing Grace are probably very familiar to every one of us, but when was the last time you thought about what those words actually say? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. In this series of messages, we've been looking at different facets of God's grace. Today, we're going to share with you one of the most striking displays of that grace that you'll be able to find anywhere in the Bible. I'm sure you're already familiar with the events leading up to the first Easter, how Jesus and his disciples came up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, how he was welcomed with a great parade, we call it the triumphal entry. But then a few days later, he was betrayed and arrested, then crucified. But on the third day, he was raised from the dead. When he was arrested, his disciples scattered. All of his disciples fled, but two of the disciples did something even worse. Judas, as you know, betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and then committed suicide. But Peter did something even worse. He denied Jesus. As he saw Jesus arrested, accused, mocked, and beaten, Peter was afraid that what was happening to Jesus might happen to him. So when various people started saying, hey, you're one of his followers, aren't you? Peter said, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't even know the man. Earlier, Peter had heard Jesus say, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And yet, here is Peter, who had just a few hours before pledged undying loyalty, willingness to die for Jesus. Here he is, denying Jesus at the moment Jesus needed him the most. People have asked me over the years, what's the worst sin a person could commit? And the fact is, every sin is ugly. Every sin is destructive, but to deny Jesus, to reject Jesus, to go so far as Peter did to invoke a curse on himself and swear out loud in public that he never knew Jesus at all, that sin has to be among one of the most grievous, one of the worst. And that's the sin that Peter committed. The Bible says that after Peter denied Jesus a third time, he realized what he'd done, and he went outside and wept bitterly. Many of you will be familiar with the song by Don Francisco called He's Alive. It's the story of the resurrection told from the Apostle Peter's perspective. And there's a couple of great lines in the song. It goes like this. When at last it came to choices, I denied I knew his name. Even if he was alive, it wouldn't be the same. Let me ask you, have you ever felt that way? That I've gone too far, I've committed a sin that's just too serious, I can never recover from it. Can God use me? God doesn't even like me very much. It'll never be the same. Most Christians I know have felt this way from time to time. And I'm sure that's how Peter felt at this moment. And that's why this next phrase means so much to me. You see, the women had gone to the tomb to anoint the bo dead body of Jesus. But when they arrived, they discovered the stone that covered the mouth of the tomb had already been rolled away, and Jesus was not there. Instead, they saw an angel sitting on the, in the cave where, where Jesus had been buried. And the angel told the women that Jesus was not there. He had been raised from the dead. Then he said this. He said, go tell his disciples and Peter. That's the phrase I want you to hear right now. And Peter. All the disciples except John had run away. All of them had abandoned Jesus silently. But Peter's rejection of Jesus was loud. It was public. And he did it three times. I can imagine at that point, Peter thought he was no longer part of the group, no longer one of the disciples. He was out. He was disqualified. I can also imagine at that point, maybe the men in the group thought Peter was out, that he basically handed in his resignation by denying their Lord. Well, this might normally be the case, except 
in this story, we see that God really is a God of restoration. And that's what we're going to talk about. You know what happened next. Peter was forgiven. He was restored. He became a leader of the church. He would go on to compose two books of the New Testament. Just a few weeks after these events, Peter was back in the pulpit, so to speak. He preached on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people were saved that day. When people, excuse me, when Peter prayed, people were healed. When Peter slept, God spoke to him in dreams. When Peter was thrown into prison, God sent an angel to rescue him. When Peter walked down the street, some people would gather so that perhaps Peter's shadow might fall on them and they could be healed. And according to the church historian Eusebius, Peter chose to die by crucifixion, not upright, because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified in the same way that his Lord had, so he chose to be crucified upside down. Having grown up in the church, I was aware of many of the events of Peter's life, specifically his denials. That's something that we were told about a number of times. After I became a Christian and I began reading the New Testament for myself, one of the things that struck me about Peter was how changed he was, that the Peter of the Gospels was certainly different than the Peter later in his life, in the book of Acts and in First and Second Peter. They seemed like two different people. When I read First and Second Peter, I was surprised he never even mentions uh, that he denied Jesus, not once. He didn't seem to be a man who was consumed by guilt. Instead, he spoke with authority and with confidence. He told his readers to practice self-control, to be holy, to avoid hypocrisy, to live for God. And I, I wondered, how can he write so boldly when just a few years before he had been so utterly broken by his denials of Jesus? Wasn't he disqualified by his sin? Well, the reason that Peter could change so much is that Peter encountered the restoring grace of God, and he fully embraced it into his own life. He found out what it truly means to have your slate wiped clean and to be given a fresh start by God. He learned that God's grace truly does restore, and that's the point I want us to see today. The critics of Peter could have said, look at this man, he has no place in the ministry. I want you to imagine Peter is coming before a church pulpit committee, a search committee, and they're looking at his qualifications. And, you know, he's impulsive. He, he has a knack for saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. That's true. Jesus even called him Satan once. Yeah, remember, get thee behind me, Satan. One time he made a fool of himself by trying to walk on water. He violently attacked a man in the Garden of Gethsemane, hacked his ear off with his sword. This guy has been troubled since day one. He has no place in the leadership of the church. Like I said, can't you just imagine a pulpit committee looking at qualifications like that? But through, though everything these critics say was true about Peter, there's one fact that negates it all, and that is the restoring grace of God. No matter how far you've fallen, no matter how many times you've fallen, you're never too far down to be picked up and restored. My God. Today you might feel like your sins have excluded you from any hope of having a good life, but I want you to know that the restoring power of God's grace is for you too. God really is the God of the second chance. He's also the God of the forgotten past. You know what God says? He says, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. And then he says, their sins, and their means your, <laughs> your sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. And then in Isaiah 43, 25, he says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Forgotten. In Micah 7, 19, he says, you will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. That's the, that's the prophet speaking there about the grace of God. If you have failed, if you have experienced the same kind of failure that Peter did, 
then I want you to know God's restoration and his divine forgetfulness is available to you too. You can benefit from the same kind of restoring grace that Peter did. So the question for us today is how? How do we get there? If your life has collapsed in failure, if you've disappointed yourself and everyone around you, if you're struggling with guilt, with the inability to let go of the past, then how do you experience God's restoring power of grace? Well, let me suggest three things for you. First of all, you've got to make sure you keep the door open. I know many people who fail, and because of their guilt and their shame, they, they close the door in their own minds to even the possibility that God might forgive them. They think to themselves, God's through with me, so I won't bother him again. You know what, if you think about it, that's what Judas did. Judas Iscariot didn't expect that Jesus would be condemned to die. And he tried to give the money back to those who had given it to him, to those who bribed him. He said, I have betrayed an innocent man. He knew what he'd done. And the temple leaders replied, too late. What is that to us? Go away. The thing is, Judas didn't wait to see what would happen next. He didn't consider the possibility that he could be saved or he might be forgiven or that he could possibly be restored. After all, Jesus had said every sin committed by man will be forgiven except for the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And that's not what Judas had done. So he didn't wait around to experience this. He closed the door. He committed suicide. You know, I honestly believe that had he not done that, the angel at the tomb might have said, go tell his disciples and Peter and Judas that Jesus is alive. But Judas closed the door on God's restoring grace. I know many people today who symbolically do the same thing. They close the door on the possibility of God restoring them. I remember a friend of mine named Tim from my Bible college days. I think he had come in around the second or third year of my, my Bible college time. We weren't close friends, but we knew each other. Then one day I'd heard that he and his wife had had a bad argument, and Tim wasn't in school that day. I'd heard that some kind of drugs or alcohol were involved, some violence was involved, the police were called, Tim was arrested and taken to jail. The thing is, he never came back to school. He abandoned his dreams of going into the ministry. I don't want to minimize the gravity of what he did, or any other kind of sin for that matter, but if God can use a man who, after walking with Jesus three years, listening to Jesus' teaching, and then could loudly, publicly, and over time after time, we deny Jesus. If God could restore a man like that, then God could restore Tim, and God can restore you. Keep the door open, my friends. Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying sin all you want. God will still forgive you. That's not what I'm saying. But I've known a lot of people who have sinned or gotten into a life of sin, and they've fallen far away from God. And none of them, if they've been restored, would say, oh, that was easy. I'm glad I did it. Let me do it again. No. Sin is ugly. Sin is painful. Sin is destructive. It always hurts. But I want you to know that by God's grace, it can be overcome. You can be restored through your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So keep the door open to that, okay? Here's the second thing, and that is to keep the light on. Now, what do I mean? Here's what I mean. I want you to, if you want to experience the restoring grace of God, make sure you continue to allow His light to shine into your life, into your spirit. Let me be specific. You do that by reading the Bible. <laughs> it's really easy to understand this. If you shut yourself off from from God when you've disappointed him. It's easy to run away, and I know that. I've experienced it, and that's what Judas did, but don't do it. King David wrote, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. See, that's the way God gets light into our broken spirit. The Bible is God's way of, of shining God's truth into even the darkest nooks and crannies of our spirits. You see, when you read the Bible, you're going to encounter people, people like you who are broken and sinful, people like Peter, 
People like King David, people like Jonah and Abraham and Moses, who all turned their backs on God at one time or another, and all committed sins that a man of God should never commit. But here's what they all have in common. They were all restored to service by the grace of God. If you are far from God, then reading the Bible will help you reconnect with him. It will help you by shining God's light into your life and reminding you of the kind of God you worship, the kind of God you have known, the kind of God who wants to reach out to you and restore you. Another way to keep the light on is to make an effort to pray. Now, I know it's hard. When you're feeling broken, when you're feeling worthless, when you're feeling like a, an utter failure with God, I know it's hard to pray. I've been there. Even if you think you aren't very good at prayer, you need to keep on doing it. Because there are times when you and I struggle with sin, and we feel guilty, we feel worthless, full of shame, and it's so hard to say anything to God. Because we're sure he has nothing to say to us. <laughs> But these are the times that our prayers are the most important. I came across this meme on Facebook the other day. If you follow my Facebook page, you may have seen it because I shared it. <clears throat> but have you ever felt like this? Where you come to God, you try to pray, and it just your thoughts are just a jumble. They're just tumbling one on top of the other. And you can't hardly get two words put together. And you just freeze. You don't know what to say. But the Bible says that at that moment, God's Spirit translates what we say into something that God understands. And there's going to be times in your life when you, your spirit is so overcome with stress or guilt or worry or fear or brokenness that all you can do is sit before God, maybe even tremble a little bit before God. But that's okay, because God says His Spirit will translate what you're feeling into prayers that can be heard in heaven. There's an old saying, it goes like this, pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. And for me, it's hardest to pray when I feel like I am God's biggest disappointment, when I'm the biggest failure on two legs. But that's when it's most important to pray. You know, King David felt this way. Because sin sometimes got the best of him. He was normally a, a very righteous man, a very holy man, a friend of God, a man after God's own heart. And yet there were times, there were times when he was just broken by sin. And he would feel, you can read this in the book of Psalms, where he felt like he was so far away from God, God couldn't even hear him. That God had turned his face away. But he prayed his way through these troubled moments. If you don't have the words to pray, work your way through the book of Psalms and read some of Psalms, the Psalms written by David that talk about his inner struggle. And yet how God was utterly faithful and never turned his back on David. Another way to keep the light on is to get with God's people. Now, let's not kid ourselves. I know some of God's people can or some people who claim to be God's people, can be kind of critical and judgmental. But you need to avoid people like that. There are others who are very gracious, who are very kind, who are like Jesus, and they have struggled like you have, but they have the Spirit of Jesus about them. And now their arms are open wide to accept you, to listen to you, to speak words of encouragement and restoration to you, to help you get back on your feet. Come alongside these people and let them minister God's grace to you. Here's the third thing you can do to keep, um, to experience God's restoring grace, and that is to keep the fire burning. Um, you know, there are two things that contributed to the way Peter changed so drastically from the Gospels, especially the end of the Gospels where he was a broken man, to the powerful preacher and the, the uh, seasoned elder of the church that we see in his epistles. There are two things that happened. First of all, he got really serious about loving Jesus. We see this beginning in John, John chapter 21. I want to spend a couple minutes there. Jesus and Peter have a conversation where Jesus restores Peter to his position of leadership. You want to see a story of transformation, read John 21. It's amazing. 
Three times in this conversation, Jesus asks of Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. So I've said Jesus did that because three times Peter denied Jesus. So three times Peter asked Jesus, do you love me? Well, what's interesting is there's a lot going on in this conversation that isn't really clear in the English text. I'd love to take you into the Greek text sometime and show you some of the things that's going on. It's really fascinating, and it makes for a good sermon all by itself. But mainly, Jesus is challenging Peter about his love for Jesus. And when Peter responds that he does love Jesus, Jesus replies by challenging him to serve others. Yeah, to serve. The fire of the Christian life is not in the rituals, not in the traditions, not in the in the um, the sermons or the potlucks we enjoy or anything else. The fire of the Christian life is fueled by your love for Jesus Christ above all else. Let me say it again. Loving Jesus comes first, always. That's why Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. It's why each time Jesus asked a broken Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes. And when Peter said, yes, Jesus gave him a job to do. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Restoration, my friends, is driven by love, and it leads to service. That's something worth noting. If you are broken and you want to experience the restoring grace of God, Take a look at your heart. Take a look at your love relationship with Jesus. Your heart may be broken today. It may be cold today. But ask him to help you love him more. The second thing that contributed to this big change that happened in Peter's life is this, that he experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. After the resurrection, before Jesus ascended into heaven, Jesus told his disciples in Acts 1.8, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You see, God's Spirit is crucial to living the Christian life. God's Spirit is crucial to serving the kingdom of God. You can't live with God in your own power. You can't serve the kingdom of God in your own strength. You can't do it by yourself. Paul says in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 16, he says, Live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. He also says in Ephesians 5.18, he says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with God's Spirit. He's saying live your life, living your life without God's Spirit is what will lead you to failure. Living your life without God's Spirit is what will lead you into sin. Living without God's Spirit is what got you into the mess you're in to begin with. After Peter was filled with the Spirit on the day of the Pentecost, his life truly began to change. He began to walk in the Spirit of God, and God began to work through him, and it was powerful. Remember, he preached the sermon, and 3,000 responded. If you want to be restored by the grace of God, then let me challenge you. Let me invite you. Fall in love with Jesus again. And then open your heart to God's Spirit. Let Him work in you. Let Him transform you. Let Him empower you. Let Him restore you. Today, let's, let's just wind it up for a couple of minutes here. We're going we're gonna to just summarize a few things. If you're a Christian today and you've done something you truly regret, then I want you to know God is in the business of restoring you, of taking your brokenness and and putting it in his past, not dwelling on it. He invites you to not dwell on it, just simply move forward. If you've done something sinful, God also wants to restore you. If you have made a dreadful mistake, God is restoring you, because that's what God's grace does. It doesn't matter how many times you've fallen, or how far you've fallen, I want you to know you can be restored by the grace of God. God is never going to give up on you. So don't you give up on God. As we wind it up today, please take note of this. God is the God of the forgotten past. He's the God of the brand new day. Let him do his work of grace in you.
God bless you. Have a great week. Be safe out there.